How are we all doing, everyone? I hope everyone is keeping well. I hope you enjoyed the last podcast about the, uh, the new soccer hockey shoes. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to actually play in them anymore since because we're still in this sort of lockdown phase, as it were. Um, but hopefully we're going to be um, coming out of that soon. So episode eight, I think now. This one's going to be uh, a nice, interesting one, and it's very topical. So we, uh, one of our patients has... Um, very kindly agreed to come on and chat to us about their injury and management and what makes it differently is this patient lives I think a good 300 miles away from me so we've never actually seen this person face to face and she is also a um a GP as well so we could then have a nice old chat about um, remote health care and how the pandemic has changed everything so Let's bring Liddy Moyer back in. There we go. You should be in now. Thank you for coming on and having a chat to us today. Did you just want to sort of introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you, if you don't mind? Yeah. Hi. So um, I'm a GP based uh, way over in Sheffield. Um, I'm quite a busy bunny. I'm a GP partner. And as you all know, it's pretty hectic at the moment. So lots of work, but also for me, lots of play to keep me sane. Um, so I'm currently mid renovation of a, a big Victorian house. Um, I'm a runner, and until uh, lockdown shut, the, the climbing gym is on a climber as well. So uh, lots of dog walking, very active. I never really sit still unless I'm actually at work. So that's my sit time. No, and also I just want to say a a massive thank you to all the GPs out there. I, I, people people know that I'm, I'm married to a GP also. So, but I think um, GPs don't always get the credit that they deserve for the hard work that is put in because there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that no one actually knows no one actually sees and you guys are crazy busy at the moment so yeah thank you and hats off to you guys so thank you yeah it's uh, pretty happy <laughs> yeah so talk us about what happened because you sort of developed an Achilles problem back in May so sort of middle of that first lockdown nearly a year ago now isn't it wow we're in March yeah. now near coming to March well mid Feb and yeah crazy time's flown by so talk us through about what happened with the Achilles yeah it, it was really strange um because it wasn't an injury as such as most people find when, when they come to my practice they say well I haven't done anything um so I started to up my running um which was a bit of a hobby really because most I would call myself a climber um and did the running to improve my cardiovascular fitness um, and obviously lockdown came, reduced the climbing so that so the running went up. So I was very sensible, um, did it very slowly, increased the distance and pace gradually. Um, and then I remember coming back from a run one day about 14K into maybe a 16K, which is a, a typical run for me, um, and just felt a bit kind of tight and strange around my left um, posterior heel. So I couldn't bend or move my ankle um, at all. So uh, it was a pretty catastrophic injury for me which instantly stopped me uh, running. I couldn't climb because the gyms were shut. We weren't allowed out of the house, really. Yeah. Um, and, so and also we were doing major renovations, so I was doing a lot of labour. Yeah, and talk me through, because when we had a chat, it was actually those renovations that most probably was one of the big catalysts as to why this was happening. Sort of, What sort of renovations were you doing? Well, we were doing the outside of the house, thankfully. So we managed to keep the builder in and keep his wage going. Um, and we essentially knocked down um, oh, I don't know how many metres of wall. Um, so I was essentially lifting and moving and cleaning stone, really heavy stone and pushing wheelbarrows of very heavy things up and down a sloped driveway. Um, so I did all the labouring um, because we couldn't have more, more staff on site and obviously to keep the costs down. Um, and that, that's quite interesting having spoken to you, Nick, because that hadn't occurred to me or been factored in at all in this injury because it started when I was running, so I assumed it was a running injury. Um, I was fairly new to them and uh, hadn't really factored in the building work because I'd been doing it, you know, eight hours a day, probably four days a week um, for six months, um, well, maybe four months at that point, without any issues, really. Uh, and I'd like to think yeah. myself as, as quite a strong person with climbing, so it, it didn't occur to me that's what the issue was. Yeah, and the thing was, that the, it was about, must have been about... 40 kilos plus in wheelbarrows that you were pushing up and oh easy um, yeah like it, full yeah full of, full of stuff, yeah and 
the thing is also it was not it wasn't along the flat was it it was up quite a steep driveway um that you were pushing up and then obviously that means that climbing upper body strength wise is going to be very very good so you could lift and push that wheelbarrow but obviously there hadn't been any yeah. sort of climatization to pushing 40 50 kilos up a steep hill for must have been excess of four hours a day yeah. or something um and yeah and it, oh, it, easily it just, yeah easily with, with that nice weather we had during lockdown it just made it possible didn't it just to stay out there nice and sunny long hours long hours of sunlight and you just need to get a crack on and get the job done while you can don't you so there was, there was so, nothing else to do i mean literally we're all locked at home yeah yeah so how did it make you then feel knowing that you then sort of developed an injury um quite panicked um i'm quite hardy and i think it's the thing with climbers that we we're quite naughty and we tend to climb through injury and i've, I've got a good kind of instinct for when i'm actually injured or if it's sore or pulled or or, or i can work around it and, and, and kind of let things heal and settle and, and i've done that quite a few times with kind of wrists and shoulder injuries um but this was beyond all that i mean i literally could not move my foot it was fixed um you know it was swollen it wasn't particularly painful it just didn't work you know it was sore um and you kind of do that catastrophic thinking don't you because because for me I really needed the runs to get out uh, and have some some headspace with the line of work on I mean, it you know it's incredibly stressful um and I was working all hours at that point as well into the night and meetings and zoom meetings and trying to set up you know hot hubs for for sick patients and covering for ill colleagues and um you know I needed that headspace so the thought to me of not being able to do any exercise from having gone from you know three runs a week and three climbing sessions a week to absolutely nothing and not having time on my own out the house um you know was quite devastating and, and quite panicking and it's, it's yeah <clears throat> one of the first times seen, I've sort we've seen a lot of that during lockdown of people using exercise to manage advice. their mental health um from yeah. Really, I mean, obviously, as a doctor, usually you know the basic. Oh, I think you're. Oh, you're back again. Sorry, I think your internet signal dropped off a little bit. Then. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's definitely we um have definitely seen a lot of increase in people using activities and exercise to manage their own mental health um during lockdown. So then, talk me through because obviously, a because of lockdown restrictions at the time, we couldn't we couldn't meet up, and b it was sort of direct then sort of from a geography viewpoint a bit silly because you were up in Sheffield I was down in sort of Hampshire way so it's sort of opposite ends of the country um so then we then had that little chat on online and then how did it then sort of feel going through that remote treatment process as it were because it's sort of a it's not nothing new new but it's still a newish concept um to everyone how does that feel compared to seeing someone face to face in the past um, I, I think it surprisingly worked really well and obviously it was interesting for me as a clinician because this is what I'm doing at the moment and, and, and it's a new era for all of us and it was interesting to see it from the patient perspective um, and yeah it worked absolutely brilliantly and I know um, you know the, the wonders of wi-fi and the internet um, it didn't really I felt confident not having your hand laid on me that you had the diagnosis um, and knew what you were doing and you know the the information you sent through was second to none. So, um, you know, I am a GP, I am a doctor, but we have a basic musculoskeletal training. So, you know, my my job is, is it broken? Is it sprained? Do I need to refer on? Is this going to get better? Um, you know, I don't do the whole, this is what you do to get better bit. That's not my job and I'm not trained in that. So, you know, to have those guides that came through that I could understand and my husband would as well as a layperson of, of you know, videos you sent through as well, leaflets, links, things that I could kind of look at. Um, and, you know, I felt very confident in the exercises I was doing. I felt very confident that I wasn't going to injure myself. And also, obviously, having spoken and consulted with you, um, I felt really confident to work through stiffness and pain and know that I wasn't damaging myself further. And, and your confidence really helped with that, because I think, you know, I see this a lot with injuries at work when people have bad backs and things and, and they they don't take painkillers because they don't want to mask the pain in case I won't believe they're injured. Um, and also they don't want to use the joint or the back or whatever is injured for fear of injuring it further or, or doing themselves some mischief. And it's, it's really hard to get that message through that nothing bad is going to happen. This is safe and this is what you need to do to get yourself better. 
Um, so it's nice. Your confidence gave me the confidence. And, and I kind of saw that as a patient a bit of that kind of, oh, no, what if I make it worse? Or I snap something and then you catastrophize about rupturing your Achilles and being in pot for a year and two years out of sport and, and all, all that kind of stuff. So that, that was really useful. And, and again, the videos, I think in some respects, um, you know, rather than the old days where you'd see someone face to face, maybe get, you know, a, a, a photocopied leaflet and off you go. I've got those videos on my phone. Um, and I've got the information, those links. So if I forgot or I wasn't sure, um, I could look at those anytime, any place, whenever I wanted to. And again, if this problem flares, you know, later down the line, I, I can pick that up and, and use that information. So that that was invaluable for me. Um, and, you know, something I think we wouldn't necessarily have done, you know, certainly a few years ago. And maybe not if this was a, you know, a face to face with a, you know, podiatrist or physio down the road, whether they'd have given me that level of, of information that was so clear. Yeah, we... um doing the the exercise and sending over emails it, it it does work really well with with the videos because it also allows us we can track whether you're doing them i can see when you open it don't open it example i can see well, all, that back end, yeah. all that back end stuff and it's something that what we try and do when we're managing someone remotely is, is try and make sure they get that same level of service whether it's face to face because we would still do the same we still send our face to face patients all those videos everything like that but i'm thinking with technology, why does remote have to be any any different? And it doesn't have to be. It's sort of we've got to embrace the technology that we've got. And we're very fortunate in a way to live in an era where I think over the last 10 years, the growth of technology has just shot up at, at a huge, huge rate. And yeah. it has allowed us to do what we've needed to do during this pandemic because I think remote healthcare was always going to be a thing, but I think the pandemic sort of forced our hand to make it a thing a lot quicker than maybe as but then as as human beings sometimes we're resistance to change and this sort of forced us to change so we we had to move on but it's it's nice to hear that we can still you can still have that level of confidence and knowing what you need to do without physically having to see someone face to face to get that um, so <clears throat> and the beauty is also because you were doing your gardening work um and renovations you had access to weights at home anyway at the end of the day 10 kilograms is 10 kilograms regardless if it's in the shape of a bit of a rock or a weight it doesn't really matter so uh that, that definitely helped so we we took you through that process got you um back to doing all your activities um and i don't think we didn't we didn't hit too many bumps along along the way a lot of it was i think just that reassuring you that it's okay and you you hit the nail on the head, I think, with we have this misconception that pain is always a bad thing, that something is being wrong or something's been damaged when it's it's not that. And it's a, you you, yeah. lose, you see a lot of people with back pain, that fear of movement. And we sit all the time with with injuries. And actually, the process we went through online with you is not too dissimilar. If you come and see us in clinic, the majority of the consultation initially is just having a chat addressing those fears those beliefs managing those expectations because i'm a big believer if we don't get that bit right early on then the whole process isn't going to work and so as a GT, you'll, yeah. know, you'll know history is key in absolutely everything that we do if we ask the right questions then we'll get the right answers so even though i didn't see you face to face you you could still fill in our pre-assessment questionnaire and from that i could see what had gone on i could see why it happened what was happening and what we needed to do about it so we got you back to running um i'm gonna be brutally honest it was i think you come across the patient that if i gave you an inch you try to take a mile shall we say um there was a bit yeah of kind of I'm quite, back. quite known for that yeah i like to take things not fully to the extreme but i'm i think for me and the profession i'm in i like to have a goal and something to work towards and to achieve something and when you reach the stage in my career i am now you know there isn't the next exam or, or the next job to get or something from there so um you know i've reflected on this recently i think i've moved that over in, into my personal life of uh, of finding an area where i can challenge myself and achieve something and get that sense of well-being from that and um i'm quite hardy i work hard i play hard and it is really difficult for me to sometimes do as I'm told. Um, I think my husband would agree um, just because I'm enthusiastic and I just, I'm a do, I want to roll my sleeves up and get on with it and, and push through. And, and as I say, with the climbing, you're used to doing that. And I think because I've gotten away with that for many years of, of just going through injuries and it not actually being too bad and being a bit of a strain, 
Um, you know, it was a real shock to have this sort of running career threatening injury as such. So, um, yeah, I, I have to say I really trusted you and I trusted the programme and the results were there. And I was quite surprised that you let me run as soon as you did and that your view on pain was the same as mine that you know you don't have to wait for this to be perfect and then you know you go running a couple of kilometers and all it niggles a bit so I'm never going to run again I need to leave it another six months you know um as you say you start to lose all the other muscles and the, and the strength you've gained that's also carrying and supporting that injury so um I did do I was told I think it was a couple of times I did a slightly longer run than I should have done but only a little bit certainly not as long as I wanted to but I did actually trust that process and um you know I, I really had faith that although it was hard sticking to, to that kind of um, pattern, that kind of small distance I was running, that I was back to running and I didn't think I'd be back to running at that stage. So, um, yeah, and obviously the further into that process we went, the more I listened and behaved because I realised it, it was working and essentially it was just myself. I was going to spite by nipping off and doing a quick half marathon. Uh, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> definitely with the the running is, I'm, I'm a big believer of trying to keep someone active as much as I can during injury. Um, a, because I think you decondition less. B, it also helps you from a mental health viewpoint going through that process. Um, and then C, I also think it helps with that return to activity. Um, like, like with your Achilles tendinopathy, Achilles don't like to be rested. Attenders don't like to be rested. They like to be loaded. We yeah. just got to load it in a way that they're happy. And if you stop running completely, for say three, four months, it would then would have hampered your progress massively long term. And again, it is just trusting that trusting that process and knowing that the that person I'm always at the end of a, a video consultation, I'm always at the end of an email if there's any niggles or queries and you sort of just gotta trust the process as it were. So then yeah, you, you return to running and I'm not sure if you told many people, but then what did you run? <laughs> like last was it last month or month before? It was remember. it was well, well in November I ran my November. first okay, uh, wow. marathon. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was. So you uh, ran your, and that's your know, first ever marathon. Yeah, and I, I'd only started running, you know, maybe 14, 16 months before that. And I did my first ten k uh, race nearly the, a day the year before to the day. Um, so you know, it, it it wasn't planned when I started running, and I got the bug. Um, and, you know, I've gone from running sort of 15, 16 K at the time when I, I think I'd just done a half marathon before, um, I had the injury. That was my first half. Um, and, you know, I just, just kept going and, you know, you, your ears must burn because you've been the topic of conversation, um, a lot of the time when I run with my, um, my colleague, um, and chatting about how my ankle's fine and it feels fine. And, you know, I often say I thought this would hurt, especially if we're sort of pushing up. It's quite hilly in Sheffield, obviously. So that, that's the other issue is it's that pushing up and the weight up the hill um, that's the issue. So um, trying to find flat runs uh, was quite interesting to get the distance in um, and then starting to put those hills back in gradually and being sensible, which is not like me. Um, and remarking all the time that my ankle was standing up and, and doing a job. And actually I was getting knee ache and hip flexor ache and back ache from bad posture and, and all the normal stuff you, you, know, you get from being a lazy uh, runner um rather than the ankle being the issue which was you know always surprised me really so that the rehab really did work and I feel very confident in the strength of my ankles now and if it starts to feel a bit niggly I get straight back onto the exercises and, and loading again and um you know often these things tail off a bit from from doing that every day religiously uh, which doesn't happen now um to kind of doing it in fits and starts and every now and then thinking well I need to to get on those exercises and get that done because I don't want to be back in that position um you know where where I can't run again. No, and that's the key point is that um, is that doing that maintenance program. So sort of that a few times a week or when when you need is just keeping up with those exercises. But I think the key point for me you mentioned there is that you feel confident now to know what you need to do if it does flare up. So you don't need to say, "Oh, Nick, my ankles flare up. What do I do?" Because every aim we have of all of our patients we see is get patients to educate them to how to manage their own problems and empower people to yeah. take control of their own their own issues um that's what we need to do and then if you then reflect on that you went from an achilles tendinopathy in may to running a marathon in november um that's quite an achievement yeah and then i, I, I couldn't start, believe it first of all i'm actually running a marathon but yeah it's it, it's amazing <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not sure you told many people that you run a marathon i think you kept it to yourself um <laughs> <laughs> people 
someone might not know that I run a marathon, Nick. I mean, you know, you have to make no. sure they're aware. However, I did see something <laughs> the other day that I think, have you set yourself another goal? Yeah, um, I am currently training again with my, my friend Liz uh, for our first ultra marathon. So uh, we are on the trails out in the peaks now, as opposed to the ring road where I used to run a lot and get a lot of uh, jip from my running friends uh, for running on the ring road when I live in the peaks. So um, yeah, much more challenging, very hilly, um, up and down, um, very, very icy very and snowy, snowy at moment. the moment, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, glorious though. Absolutely. I, I live for it now. And, you know, unfortunately, the climbing gyms are shut again. And that will always be my first passion. But I've really, really taken running into my heart. It's a huge part of my life. And I probably run six or seven hours a week now, at least. Um, so, yeah, it's gone from a bit of plodding around the ring road to um, really setting some major goals. And, and I'm sure I said I'd never run a marathon. I said I'd never run an ultra. Now we're, you know, we're doing a shortest ultra. And then now we're thinking ahead to our 100k ultras. And oh God, what else comes from there? I don't know. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hooked. <laughs> give, give it a year or two and I'm going to find out you're going to be running from Land's End to Jono's Grote or something. It's sort of like... <laughs> oh, God, I hope not. My poor hips. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once... Um, restrictions lift and you can then get back into climbing what are your plans to try and then because it sounds like you've really got the running bug now what are your plans to try and then but i'm guessing you still want to get back into climbing yeah How, what, what's the plan to try and merge the two together um ironically i think i'm gonna have to take a third sport up and start doing some yoga or pilates because at the moment i've lost all flexibility in my legs and i remember the last climb i did before lockdown it was my birthday, actually, and um, I'm known for my flexibility and long leg reach for difficult holds, and I couldn't do it, and my husband and my, my friend were laughing at me because I was just sort of swinging about like an idiot trying to flick my legs over because I didn't have the reach anymore. So it sort of dawned on me that I've been tightening all my muscles up um, and, and losing that flexibility. So I think um, to get back to where I was, and I'm sure it's worse now with another few months of climb, uh, with running, um, I think that's going to be the key is actually doing some working out because I'm quite a lazy sports person. I just, I climb. That's how I improve my climbing. When I run, I just run. Um, and, and this injury has taught me really that I need to do that work to build up the muscle groups uh, and to improve on the weaknesses uh, and include, um, you know, a bit more flexibility. So I think that's the new goal. I will definitely go back climbing. We go at least twice a week and I can fit that in because it's usually evenings. Um, yeah. But I think I'm going to have to actually be a big girl and, and start doing some um, of, the, of the homework, really, um, to get Definitely. myself in, in a better shape. So I'm not getting injured as well. No, and you, you, that's you definitely turned the corner because prior to the Achilles injury, you would never have said that. But you realise now <laughs> that it's you would have deconditioned from climbing to a degree because you haven't done it for so long because you haven't had access to it so you couldn't expect to climb at the level you did climb when you were climbing on a regular basis and then taking six six to twelve months off climbing you're then going to have to put some work in to get in your body ready to doing that again and gradually introduce it and doing all yeah. that should then significantly reduce your risk of of getting an injury but it, um it's, it's nice to hear that everything's going in the right direction and the whole process works and you are you, you sort of really brought into the fact of, okay, I need to take care of myself and do things properly, but also then empowered yeah. that you know what to do yourself without having to keep trying to get hold of me or something to say, I've got this injury, I've got this injury. It's a case of, I know what I need to do now to manage it and keep pushing myself forward, which is fantastic. Well, I mean, you know, from, from my point of view, you know, even if you take me as a lay person, which essentially I am when it comes to, to rehab and, and looking at injuries but from that point of view, you know, I, I've gone from not knowing what was wrong to me uh, with me to, to getting a, a decent diagnosis first time to having the correct management, um, you know, plenty of support and follow up. Um, and then, as you say, now I've got that confidence to kind of move on um, and deal with that. Should I have any, any issues in the future? And, you know, the, the big kind of light bulb moment for me was when you worked out what had caused it, because I'm pretty good at problem solving. It's what I do for a living. Um, but because this is a kind of repetitive strain injury, um, you know, and it didn't hurt when I did the building work or cause any problems. You know, you start to think, well, that makes absolute perfect sense. The load I must have been putting through, um, you know, my ankles and my legs. And, and again, I think in some respects it was it was made worse by the the fact I have such good upper body strength because I've got the weight to, to do it with the arms 
um, that you just forget about the whole kind of leg bit. And now I'm aware of that. I, I can feel it. You know, even, even now, if I push a heavy um, supermarket trolley around and I'm having to resist against something, I can feel that starting to pull at the back of my heels. Um, and I know, you know, more than anything, things to avoid and things not to do where I've got wheat beaks that still aggravate me. Um, and then that's that kind of reminder, right, I need to go back and do some more of those strengthening exercises because I shouldn't be struggling to push a heavy trolley round. Um, you know, most people can do that, that, that don't climb and run and, and all the rest of it without injuring their ankles. So, um, you know, that that was important to me is addressing what caused it. And I often find that with patients, you know, they come in with numerous repetitive injuries that don't need to, to see a physio or, or anybody from there. But, you know, I often say the key to this is finding out what the injury is. You know, if we don't find what's causing it, you're going to continue to repetitively mm -hmm. do that. It ain't going to get better. And most things will get better with time and rest. Um, so, you know, that that to me was the crux of, you know, and it's not as if I've not thought about that or sat down or tried to work out. And again, you just assume because the injury started or showed itself with the running that I've obviously pulled it or twisted it or done something running and you know, at a time when I was gradually increasing my distances, I just assumed that was the issue and, and got quite disheartened that I'm never going to be able to kind of get that distance any further um, and, and reach those goals. So that that was a huge thing for me, is just having that, that diagnosis, but also the mechanism of injury as such. Um, it helps me get my, my head around that so I know what I'm doing moving forward. It's funny you used the um, sort of detective analogy. I use that all the time with patients that say in the medical world, it's basically we're a detective and patient is sort of like the crime scene and the victim and it's sort of yeah you, you hold all the answers I've just got to ask you the right question and then put the pieces of the puzzle together and it will give me the answer that that's, that's why the I get... part of the job isn't it and yeah oh, it is and um oh. and the beauty of it is that no two crime scenes are the same no two patients are the same I could see 10 different Achilles problems in clinic and they all have a slightly different reasons or history or pattern as to yeah. why it happened and it's this is why I I luckily I've got I've got the luxury of time so my initial points are normally up to say 45 minutes well I'd so I don't have <laughs> the, I, I don't have <laughs> seven minutes like you guys do or 10 um but I've got the luxury of time and I've got the luxury of getting people to fill out that four page questionnaire before they come seeing and having a looking around on on what's on social media and whatnot and, and it was as soon as i you put in the history form about the the gardening and then as soon as i saw that you were speaking about doing your gardening work i think okay this is going to be a um this is going to be what's most probably contributed significantly to getting this this injury and then it's just then sort of stripping it back to basics getting that working diagnosis working out why it happened and then you can then sort the problem out and the body, as I said, if I don't fix people, the body will do it itself. I just got yeah. to help you put it in the right environment to let the body do what it needs to do. Um, yeah, it, it will I work mean, as well. I've, I've, I've got to say, you know, because I, you know, I would call myself a professional nosy person. I am a problem solver. That, that's what I do is I, I, I problem solve all day. Um, but I have to say from a kind of patient point of view and also as a client, if you like, for a private service, is that questionnaire is amazing. So so what I feel is I feel I'm getting my money's worth as well because it's not that question where you might go to someone and they're, oh, I'm not sure and, oh, we'll do this and, oh, you need eight sessions and you've got to pay for this and you've got to come back and if that doesn't work, we'll try this. And, you know, the, the confidence was there. The di As you say, the diagnosis was there. The history is, is the big part. Uh, and essentially, in your time, that was done um, before we got to the consultation. So we could actually use that consultation to consult about the injury and about getting that better. Um, you know, and I find that's a frustrating bit for us as, as GPs. You know, we're doing all that history um, and then we're trying to examine the patient. We've got to formulate what's wrong with them. We've got to try and think of a management plan. We've then got to potentially, you know, write up or refer or, or whatever and then type all the notes up. So it's, it's a lot to get through. Um, and it's lovely when you get a follow up with a patient where you've got the diagnosis and you're either bringing them back or you're actually treating them and addressing that and you, and you feel you know much more of a connection and you're doing a better job um but as i say from a you know from a client point of view you're using my time and your time wisely and i feel you kind of get any money's worth from that as well because the work's been done and we're addressing the issue in that consult we are consulting um and i think that's a great and again I'm, I'm a very busy person you know i, I joke that i don't stop but i don't if i, if I want to do the fun things um, I have to squeeze them in around a very, very busy job at the moment. So to spend two hours consulting with somebody about something, you know, that's a lot of my time I've got to find somewhere and would probably get neglected yeah. and not dealt with. So the fact I could do that questionnaire 
give you all that stuff, not be interrupted, say exactly what I wanted to and feel heard um, was great for me. And then we had a very concise, good, organised consultation. So, you know, the, your system works really well. Um, and certainly you. something we could, we could learn about in general practice a bit more. Uh, and we were moving yeah. towards that. I know with, with the advent of online consultations, we are starting to do that a bit where we would give patients a questionnaire and just say, look, what's wrong? What do you think's wrong? What would you like? What do you want to help you? What are you expecting? Um, to give us a bit more of an idea. Um, and, and it works. No, no, thank you. It is definitely, I, I learn a lot from that questionnaire as well, from how people fill it in. Um, you can get people that fill it in very sparsely and don't, and then you get people who fill it in with just the right amount of information. Then you get people that will fill it in and submit three or four extra pages as well. And you, so you can learn a lot about, yeah. <laughs> and then you can then use the consultation to then plug the gaps and the extra questions I need to ask that, from the information. And you can then really say, make that consultation really personalized and precise to help get us where we need to get to because a lot of those those questions in that questionnaire are standard questions that, as you say, you can do at midnight if you wanted. It doesn't matter when they get yeah. done. Um, and it takes me sort of a minute or two to sort of read it since I've been I've been, I've been using those questionnaires all for about four or five years now. So I've got a sort of knack of scanning them and picking up the bits that are really important. And then I then once I've done that, I will then write down a few notes of other questions I need to ask as my reminders. So then that you can then really focus in and just basically then use that consultation just to have a proper chat as it were to then plug yeah. those gaps and and get to where we need to and just make effective use of everyone's time because um i think money isn't the biggest commodity in modern day life time is and we're all mm. all so time poor and technology is great and it's fabulous and it allows us to do stuff like this but also with a mobile phone you're constantly contactable um it, it's yeah, yeah. It's, um this is sometimes the beauties when you go to some when, when i go on holiday when i go to the west country like cornwall um there are some places where i can't get mobile phone reception and you think that's it's actually quite nice not not to be yeah i can't oh yes i turn my phone off at times yeah absolutely <laughs> so um so how have you guys found the um from a gp perspective doing the remote consultation stuff and have your patients sort of fed back about it so far yeah it's it's been a huge eye-opener and I think it will revolutionize you know how we move forward in general practice really and, and you know it was coming in we were starting to do sort of GP-led triage so essentially patients um give us the information we, we would read that in some format and decide whether they maybe needed to see a nurse or a doctor or a pharmacist or what have you rather than everybody seeing the doctor um and it's kind of ramped that up and and, and bought the technology there that, that wasn't there so um, you know, some of these computer programs, some practices are starting to use what we're heavily dependent on email, whereas now we've got programs where I can phone patients, I can do video calls, um, I can send them documents and sign documents that we wouldn't have been able to do before, um, which is fantastic. It's instantaneous for the patient. You know, we now try and do all of our prescriptions electronic. And although we were doing that for a good while before, it's really, you know, forced the hand that people are more willing to do that, which cuts down on, you know, travel in and out of the surgery, um, not just in COVID times, but obviously we've got rooms full of sick people at all times. So the less traffic, the better. Um, the environmental cost of that, of not printing things off, um, you know, and transporting things mm. around. Um, but yeah, I mean, as you alluded to earlier, most of my job is the talking and it's the history. Uh, and we were always taught at medical school, you know, 80% of the diagnosis comes from talking and listening, um, you know, to the patient. And a lot of the examinations we do, um, sometimes it's so the patients feel they've been examined and, and know that we're sort of paying attention. Um, often we don't need to do that. You're just going through the motions to check there's nothing else there and there's nothing worrying. Um, so it's, it's been it's been fantastic. It's been great for us and it's working pretty well. Um, and again, you know, what we do is we use that as a tool. So if you speak to patients or you see a patient or do a video call and that's not good enough, um, that then you bring them into the practice and you, you know, you do the old fashioned bit and see them and examine them and, and do what needs to be done. But you know, 90% of my workload, surprisingly, and it did surprise me, I can do on the phone, you know, even without video calls, mm. um, we can get really high quality images sent through from patients. So any sort of skin lesions or rashes, lumps and bumps, um, you know, anything weird or funny they want us to see um, is straight there on my laptop in front of me and I can talk to them in real time about it. Um, I mean, one thing I will say is I think, you know, 
general practice to sing its praises a bit is is really forward thinking and we are very um quick to change and we move and we adapt um certainly far quicker than our hospital colleagues are able to um and we found that in covid you know overnight um when this all kicked off back in march last year you know we literally changed our way of operating overnight and you know what people don't realize is is general practice is a private small business so we have a contract yes. with nhs england to provide services um but i am a small business owner i have a business to run i have all the legal implications that come with that looking after our staff and keeping them safe and then obviously the duty of care and responsibility to the patients so you know we've worked together as a group of small businesses uh, in a network um and you know put hot hubs in place and um seen each other's patients and worked together and covered each other's staff when people have been sick to keep all of our businesses viable but also to make sure we're providing excellent patient care and that people are safe and looked after because if our surgery went down if we all came sick with covid you know we've got nearly five thousand patients with no doctor all of a sudden and they can't all just yeah. go to the local walking center so um you know we have to do that planning and, and technology has been huge for us because we can work from home so if we're not desperately ill but we have to isolate you know the show goes on and, and we carry on so that that adaptation and that forward thinking um and the collaboration that we're doing as, as general practitioners is, is just been you know humbling um to, to see the efforts from colleagues and, and friends and um, you know, the kind of things we've managed to put in place and change. And, and, and we're hopeful we're going to take a lot of that forward in the future um, and, and be even braver to, um, you know, get things working as efficiently and as safely as we can, but also in a way that patients like. And as you say, on the whole, how do patients feel? Um, I think they love it. You know, there's no, I've got to go to the doctors. I need to leave work. I need to travel half an hour down the road. They're running 40 minutes late. I've got to sit in the waiting room. I'm panicking because I'm not going to pick the kids up on time. Um, you know, we, we don't give them a strict time, but we say, look, we're going to call you. Everyone's got a mobile, especially at the moment everyone's stuck at home um, and, and they love it. They answer the phone. The consult's done. It's 10 minutes of their day rather than an hour. Um, and, and they feel they're being looked after. So um, for me and as a patient as well, having done that with my doctor's surgery, it's so much better because they're open when I'm at work. So it's always a hassle for me to get to the doctors. So for them just to call me, me to answer the phone and say, brilliant, yeah, great um and, and get my issue sorted it's, it's been you know so much easier so i think moving forward um things are going to change we're not going to go back to how we were before and, and that's a bit hard to get our head around but i don't think general practice will ever be the same again now no i think yeah medicine in, in as a whole is is i think going to the change and it's, it's that ability to be able to adapt quickly and, and i think a lot of people don't realize that every gp surgery is effectively a a small business that has its contracts with the NHS and you've still got to to run that and I suppose one positive of that it does make you very easy to and adapt to change and and whatnot and I think yeah. this is part of the reason why the vaccination program in the UK is going so well is because we've got a fleet of GPs that are used to vaccinating en masse in flu clinics every year anyway and actually, overnight the government tower said GPs you need to do this and we're like yeah Monday morning we're ready let's go it's sort of yeah we are extremely lucky in that sense to be able to just to get up and go and that there are going to be people who who will struggle with a concept of change and, and whatnot but it is going to happen and i think it just makes everything more more effective long term because it's, as i said earlier the that commodity of time um if you need to if you're a busy working family and you've got stressful jobs and whatnot and kids at preschool site for example I do what I do, my wife's a GP, and I've got two children under three. And so trying to find time to physically go out to appointments is, is difficult. However, trying to find 10, 20 minutes in the day to have a kind of conversation is much easier. And the beauty of, of everyone being in lockdown, no one feels embarrassed anymore if you're on the phone and all of a sudden you hear a child asking for something in the background. It's just part of normal life now, which is yeah, which is nice. And it's sort of um I, th I think that all started when that Sky News presenter had their child come in asking for biscuits or something. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking that that child's incredibly intelligent because I think that child could have asked for anything at that given time and they would have got whatever they wanted. Now is the time to do it. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got a little dog who likes to, to leap in on Zoom calls and all, all those kind of things. So uh, he gets a bit bored when we stood talking all day. But um, 
Yeah, it, it's great and it's fun. And I think, um, you, you know, I think moving forward, I've had lots of elderly patients, actually, especially when it comes to secondary care, that, that really value the phone clinics, especially for routine follow up if they're under the haematologist for some, you know, stable but long term blood disorder and they have the blood test done. They don't need to see the patient. And it saves, you know, poor little old Edith having to get out in the snow pay for public transport or pay extortionate parking fees, try and, you know, find herself around the hospital or wait till a daughter can take her, um, you know, and it's a day trip out rather than than a 10 or 20 minute phone yeah. call with a consultant. So, you know, I, I think, you know, although some cohorts were initially reluctant, you know, and scared of the change, they've all embraced it. And, and let's be honest now, the 70 and 80 year olds of today aren't the same as they were when I was a kid. You know, they've all got smartphones. They've all got the Internet. If they haven't, their children will do it for them. Um, and the first, I remember the very first video call I did, and I was a bit nervous because it was it was brand new um, app that we were having to use this new technology. Um, and it was with a fairly elderly lady, and, and we both kind of, you know, nearly hugged each other over the internet because we were so pleased with ourselves. We got it to work, <laughs> and how straightforward it was. And you know, that's been a really good precedent to say to my younger patients that are a bit anxious about it. Look, you know, if if eighty year old Edith can do this, um, you'll be fine. You know, it's the first smartphone; it's easy um uh, and just being patient and understanding with, with people and the technology so i think it's um another good side effect to covid really is is the advent of of the elderly and the older generation embracing technology a bit more to keep in touch and i know we certainly bought my um mother-in-law a smartphone she was always very resistant to the internet and technology uh, and we can't get her off google now so i'm paying an extortionate amount for her data she's getting through every month um because she's isolated and it's keeping her entertained and in touch with family so I think certainly, um, you know, this has been a great experience for me with you, Nick, to, to kind of see it from a patient and personal perspective of how well this works and that we're doing the right thing in the NHS um, and that it's safe um, and, and it's a positive experience. Um, and I've really enjoyed our, our consults. It's been done with, with good humour and I feel, you know, I know we know each other a little bit personally, but you've got the measure of me and got to know me and you felt you knew how to handle me because I will I will take a mile if you give me an inch um, and I think that's a really important thing that we do in general practice is we know our patients and have that continuity relationship that I treat everybody, as you say, slightly differently, even with the same diagnosis, because I know they're going to respond in a different way. Um, and that's part of the skill and the beauty of the job is knowing you have to tell patient A that they need to do exactly this and spell it out. Another patient, you can be a bit cheekier and have a bit of a laugh about it. And then the third patient might almost need a bit of a threat. Um, and it's spelling out that bad things are going to happen if they don't. So you know, same consultation, same same issue, three very different scenarios of how you would actually handle that and, and, and make those patients better and get them to help themselves. So it's, you know, it's a challenging job to do when you don't know people well. Um, and, you know, th there's the skill, isn't it, of, of having that personal touch and um, the interpersonal skills, which I feel you, you do really well. No, thank you. I think it is, I think it's a big skill to learn in, in any medical profession is knowing how to approach that consultation to build that no like trust relationship with that patient so they can trust you got their best interests and you're going to do the yeah. best thing for them and for me i i generally like a little bit of like humor anyway because i think it breaks yeah. down a lot of <laughs> barriers and whatnot so in clinic we are very relaxed everyone calls us on a first name basis and we yeah we're just quite right and that, that seems to sort of break down a lot of barriers with patients so they can then open up because the more we can get patients to tell us the better better service we can make for those patients so uh, but no i just want to say a massive um thank you for coming on and and having a chat believe it or not we're sort of approaching 45 minutes who knew we'd sit here and just have a have a chat about things for sort of three quarters of an hour and yeah. then also i just want to say a massive thank you for sort of being a gp and just helping everyone during this um pandemic and hopefully light is at the end there is light at the end of the tunnel and we'll be out of this soon but time will tell we shall see but if not we'll just keep persevering keep moving on and we'll we'll get there in the end so thank you very much indeed thank you and thanks for having me and again you know to your team thank you you're doing good things and you're keeping people going and it, it you know mentally and psychologically it's so important thank you very much indeed so next month um we're gonna have a, a special podcast and i'm not going to tell you what it is yet because it's going to 
be with our new member of staff who's starting soon. Um, so, and I don't want to tell anyone too much, so you just have to wait and see. As always, don't forget to um, like and subscribe um, to the podcast. If you have any questions, always just pop them in the comments below. And if not, everyone stay safe and we shall see you next month. Bye.